I want to start with right away is to give you uh, a sense of what it is to write uh, socket programs and why it's important. So if you remember the way we discussed how an application is written is that we have some kind of uh, application over here and then we have other, the other end of the application over here. This is a networked application and between the two we have what I call, uh, what I've been calling the pipe. And this pipe has uh, over here the API, the application programmer interface over here and there's the API over there. And we actually have two kinds of applications. The client are two ends of a communicator. I'll just talk about that in a minute, called client and server. So we saw an example of a client server application as the secure shell or NFS. And you know, so you have some sense of what the, these client and servers are. What we're going to go to in, in quite a bit of detail today is this API over here. We'll understand exactly what's in that API. And also, by the end of the class today, you should know enough to be able to write your own networked application in, in C. Um, um, and uh, if you don't want to use C, you can write it in Java or Python or Perl or whatever you want. But I'm going to cover it in C for, for two good reasons. One is that the C API is sort of the first one that came out and uh, it, it has a lot of details and these details are important and these are kind of glossed over and hidden by the, uh, by the uh, Java and other APIs. So I don't want to hide them, I want to show you what's actually going on. And the second thing is that uh, the, the C API is sort of the most widely used. It's, you know, most networking code uh, ends up being written in C at the, at the bottom layer anyway. And so it's good to, to, good to see what's there. So Java is close to C. The syntax is almost the same for the, per, 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 the portion of C I'm using. The syntax is more or less the same. So if you know Java, you'll understand what I'm doing. Uh, and then um, the, uh, yeah, and Python is basically the same as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to first talk, give you an overview. So this is sort of where the fits in. What we're going to focus in is really on this interface over here. All right. So Put those sheets aside for a moment because there's a bit more detail. I'm going to first tell you uh, how to understand what's going on, you know, before you actually uh, read through it. So imagine, imagine that uh, actually it's not imagination. With all this lousy weather that we've been having, I've been I was thinking of going on a trip, you know, to to some warmer place and you know, the beach. But uh, on a professor's salary, you can't quite do that. You, know, you have to make a lot more money. You have to work for RIM or something. Or rather, you should work for RIM in the old days, not now. And <laughs> right now, you should work for Facebook, I guess. But anyway, um, so I thought, uh, you know, how to make some extra money. And I realized I have excellent drawing skills. As you can see, you know, I can, I can actually draw quite well. I have remarkably good drawing skills. And I actually have an office in Davis Center, which is not completely used up with books and papers and so on. I have a little bit of Space. So I thought maybe I'd open a tattoo parlor, you know, and uh, <laughs> make some money because with my drawing skills and my fine use of pigment and line, I can actually make some extra money and maybe I can take my family on a trip to the beach. So what do I need to do in order to do that? You know, besides violating all sorts of rules about opening businesses on campus, uh, which we'll set aside for the moment, uh, presumably I need to tell people this business exists, otherwise it's not going to work, right? So what I need to do is to sort of set up uh, a, a signboard like this. So this is my office. This is Davis Center, I guess. Sort of looks like that. And that's, I, I'll, I need a separate entrance because I don't want everybody to use the same. So I'll put a staircase outside Davis Center and that's my window there. Make that into a door. I'll put a sign over here, you know, Professor Kesha's tattoo parlor. Tattoos, okay. So there, we have that uh, set up. And so I have a name, I have a door. And uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, listen for somebody, some customer to come so I can make some money. So here is a person, uh, my beautiful drawing skills at work, and they come up and they basically knock on the door. And when they knock on the door, I'm going to let them in. And at this point, I can, you know, do the tattoo, charge the money, and off they go. And then I shut the door, the next person comes in, and so on, right? Notice that the relationship between the two is uh, asymmetric, right? Uh, this person doesn't need a sign on the door saying, I want a tattoo, right? They just kind of see the sign that says tattoo parlor and they go there, right? 
so I have to put up the sign and this person doesn't. So there's an asymmetric relationship over here and Okay, so so this side over here, the person who's setting up this this kind of uh, service, okay, this is the tattoo service, is called the service side, and this side obviously is the client, right? The client is the person who is uh, accepting the service. So we can therefore think of the following way in which we provide a service. The server, which is uh, in, in this case not a piece of hardware but a piece of software like a web server or app server generally speaking, is going to uh, set up a, a kind of a site. So this is where you can obtain service from. It's exactly like a storefront, all right? And the client is somehow made aware of the existence of this service and therefore is going to uh, initiate a communication or connection with the server and at that point you can get service. Okay, that's the basic kind of setup and as you can see, uh, yeah, it requires the server to do something different from what the client does. That's why you have basic asymmetry in the client and the server side, okay? And this is exactly the same for the internet. On the internet, when you go to a web server, the server is sitting there saying, okay, I'm open for all customers, and the client says, I want to connect to this server, and then you connect with the server, okay? So when you write a, a networked application, it's necessary for you to divide the application, or at least part of it, into the server side and the client side, where the server is going to set up a well-known address where everybody can get to and then the client establishes connection with it and as you can see this is inherent in the nature of how you provide service whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer system whether it's a client server or whether it's a, a tree-like structure in all cases we need a client side and the server side okay so the way we're going to do this is that the server is going to uh, uh, essentially establish uh, 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 a storefront, if you will, and then the client is going to. Uh, so let me draw the the semantic things that are going on. So we can draw the client side and the service side like this. So the server is going to establish a storefront. And then it's going to go and listen, right? And the listen is going to be uh, essentially forever. You're going to sit there and just listen and listen and listen until somebody comes, right? Until it's a customer. The client is going to, instead of establishing a storefront, is going to determine the server location. Right, you've got to figure out where the server is and then you're going to connect and over here, like so. Right? That's the first thing that's going to happen between the client and the server is that the server has got to be listening and the client has to knock on the door as a connect. And when that happens, the server is going to do an accept of the connection. And after that, what happens is a connection is established and both sides cannot talk to each other. Even though the client initiated the connection by making the connect, uh, okay, connection over here, both sides can actually talk to each other and so it's a read and write and both sides can do read and write. And at the end, either the server or the client says, okay, you're done, close. One of the two or both say close and then the connection goes away. Right, so this is basically how any service works. You need to go to a restaurant, the restaurant owner has to set up the storefront, is listening for a customer, customer walks in, you accept the customer, and then they have some exchange, and then either the restaurant owner says, go away, you're closing, or the client says, I'm done, I'm leaving, and then both ends close, and the transaction is over, right? So this is how we are going to write network applications. Next level of detail is now going to figure, we're going to figure out, look at how we uh, uh, create, do these semantic steps. What does it mean to establish a storefront? How do we do listen? How do we do accept? How do we determine server location? How do we connect? How do we read and write? How do we close? And as you can guess, each of these corresponds to a system call or a library call that's provided by the communications infrastructure, okay? And so today's lecture, 
is going to be the only lecture like this where we're actually going to look at real code. And this piece of code that we're going to go through is sort of super important. That's why I'm covering it in class because this is sort of the prototype network application. It's a very, very simple network application. But any network application that you want, including your homework assignments, would be essentially taking this core and then expanding from it. So this is a very, very solid foundation. Once you've got this piece of code figured out, you pretty much know how to write a network application for the rest of your life, okay? Which is kind of nice. So it's worth paying attention to <laughs> what you learn in this lecture is what you probably be asked if you go ever take a job interview, they're going to ask you on this, ask you questions about this. And if you ever have to write a network application or use the internet as part of your application, this is what you're going to have to remember. So it's a super important uh, material, uh, practically speaking, if not uh, you know, pedagogically speaking. Okay, so before doing that, I want to talk to you about two data structures. And once you understand the data structures, uh, you'll understand pretty much uh, what's going on. So <clears throat> the two data structures, one is called the, uh, the socket. Let me get the exact uh, name so that I'm not going to mess it up. So, uh, right, so there's the socket. So I should probably call it, okay. Okay, so I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to talk about three things, the socket, table, there's the socket, and then there's something called the uh, host end. Okay, right, okay. So the three data structures that kind of encapsulate everything that we're going to do are called the socket table. The, there's something called the sock adder IN. So this sort of uh, means socket address internet and then the host entity or the host, yeah, host entity. And these names, names are a bit cryptic, but it doesn't really matter too much. First of all, let me talk about what is meant by socket and then what's meant as socket table, okay? Uh, I'm sure you've all written programs that read and write from files, right? So how many of you have written done file I.O. In, in a prior class? So you've all done file I.O. And so you know that to do file I.O. you need a handle. You need a identifier, like a file descriptor or some kind of handle to which you can do I.O. from, right? You can read and write from that. The equivalent in the network case of a file ID, uh, uh, handle is called a socket. Okay, a socket is something on which you can read and write from, which is exactly what we want to do. We want to connect and we want to read and write from. So these endpoints that you're going to read and write from are called sockets. Okay, so we have two sockets, one on the client side and one on the server side, and these are the sockets. So each, so the ultimately what we want to do is to have the client side and the server side both own a socket that they can read and write from, and magically these two sockets are connected, so when you write from here, you read from there and the other way around, right? So it kind of communicates with each other. All right, so the set of sockets that are available to a particular client or a server is put in a socket table, okay? So what we actually have is sort of the socket is just the index into the socket table, and the socket table contains all the necessary information about that socket, who is it talking to, et cetera, uh, what state is it in, has it been established, is it, you know, what's going on with it, all that is in the socket table. And so the socket itself is nothing more than the index into here. So the socket is just a, it says socket number one, number two, number three, and so on. And it's just a small integer, okay? And so the, is the socket uh, file descriptor, is this, uh, the, the socket over here, uh, uh, the socket file descriptor, FD, is just an integer basically, okay? It's an int because it's the index into the socket table. So socket FD is like three or five or two, and it just points into socket table, which really has all the information over there, okay? The second thing, okay, any questions about socket table? Right? And the reason we have more than one socket open is because if you think of a web server, it may have 2,000 open connections. So it'll have a socket table, which has 2,000 entries on it, right? Because you saw the 2,000 connections that are open. The second one is what's called the sock adder IN. This is sort of this stuff over here. What is it that's stored in the socket table corresponding to this socket? So what we really want to know over here, okay, is who are we talking to, okay? That's basically what we want to know. And so this has got uh, uh, three, uh, three fields in it. 
and the uh, so, so the three fields one of them is called the address family and I'll talk about that in a minute then there is the uh, IP address and then there's the port number okay all right so what is the address family when sockets invented which is roughly around 1978 1979 uh, the the idea was that sockets would be used to talk about the internet as well as other networks that existed at that time okay there were many other networks that existed at the time all of which kind of went away the, uh, and and i don't want to give you the names are not relevant but at that time internet was only one of the many networks that were possibly available and so the idea was that each network could have its own way of naming endpoints okay it could some some could be called uh, uh, you know using IP addresses some would use uh, other addresses so we want when you say we have an address you really need to know which network this is address belong to otherwise it makes no sense right and so uh, the address family today there are only two left one is called AF INET address family internet and the other one is called AF Unix, which means this is sort of a, what we call a local socket. It's a communication within the server to another, uh, the client and the server are on the same, actual same machine, same uh, computer has both the client and the server, and then we call it AF Unix. We won't really study that very much at all. So let's just assume for now that this address family is basically going to be hard coded to AF INET because we're not going to use anything else. Okay, pretty much everything's going to be AF INET. The IP address is the address of this endpoint, okay? So we're going to establish a connection. We're going to have to say which IP address and which port we want to connect to. So obviously we're going to have that over here. What about on the server side? What IP address should we put on the server side? This is basically like a no op, you know, we don't really want to say anything. We just want to say any address will do, okay? So either it's the IP of server to connect to, or any, any means I'm going to accept a connection from anyone. In theory, the server could say I'm going to accept connections only from this source IP address, though it's actually never done. You know, almost always we say I'll take any customer. It's like saying I'm going to serve only that one customer over there. Why would you want to do that? So we don't usually do that. And then the port number on the client side is which port number are you connecting to? So as you remember, as you may know, uh, web servers on port 80, right? So we have servers sitting on port 80. So on the client side, what we're going to do is to say connect to the port number on the, the server's port. And on the server side, what you're going to say is listen on this port, listen on port 80, listen on port 50, whatever it is, listen on that port. So this is how we're going to set up the listen. The listen is going to say, oh, I'm going to uh, listen on this port and, you know, the IP address, of course, is your own IP address. And I'm going to accept IP addresses from anyone. Okay, so this is the, so this is, I guess, the third thing. And the fourth thing is what's called the host end. The host end is basically um, the, the, uh, uh, a, a way to describe the destination IP address. Okay, so the, this, this is the, what is, the, what is returned by DNS, the domain name server, okay? So what we're going to do is that we are given a server's name, let's say cs or uwaterloo.ca, okay? Uh, we want to figure out the IP address, okay? How do we do that? We're going to call the DNS and say, I want to know the IP address of cs or uwaterloo.ca and what is returned by DNS is this uh, structure called host end, which contains the IP address, but it's in a funny format. And from our purpose, we don't really care what that format is. But as far as we're concerned, this is basically the host address. And then we're going to copy this into here. Okay. The IP address goes into here. Okay. So that's basically the data structures involved in the, in the uh, communication. And then the whole, uh, uh, Communication then becomes filling up these structures the right way, 
And then once you fill it up, we can establish the storefront, we can listen, we can accept, and we can do the client side, okay? And so if these structures look a bit complicated, uh, don't worry, as you go through the code, you know, you'll see exactly what's going on. Okay, now we're going to have some, well, I won't say it's going to be fun. It's going to be a bit dry, but you know, uh, this is what you get paid for, so. <laughs> Let's see. What do I do here? Okay, I'm going to start over here and I'm going to go through the server.c file and I'm going to actually go through it line by line. I was going to actually write this on the board, but we don't need to because we all have the same thing here, so there's no point. So I'm going to start by kind of really reading through it line by line and uh, if you have any questions, you know, I'll stop and answer them. So let's start at the top, server.c. Um, so this is a simple server and this source code is on Piazza. And if you were to take it and run it, it will work. In C, uh, just like in Java, we have these modules that you kind of import or make part of your program. In C, we use what's called the hash include. And there's a sort of set of standard libraries, in this case, what are called header files, .h files that we include. And that's all the goo up front, stdio, standard io, uh, standard library, there's some strings that we're using, there's some uni standard type socket. So this set of one, two, three, four, seven includes are uh, kind of standard, okay? And you can just think of them as being syntactic goo, and they'll give you the appropriate uh, access to the appropriate data structures and so on. And so uh, I'm not gonna go into that very much. It really isn't, it isn't really te teaching you much about socket programming. It's just what you need to do in order to get started. The next one is this thing called error. So this error is ex equivalent of a Java try catch, okay? Where we say, if you have an error, then p error says print error, p error is this thing and we basically says print the error message and you get out exit okay so we just want to catch errors when writing networking code you have to expect trouble okay because so many things can go wrong you may try to resolve the IP address for a name and there's no IP address or you may try to connect but the connect network is down so about half the code actually is error processing where you say try this oops didn't work get out, and so he has this error, because we're constantly getting error. So, uh, by and large, the internet works today. That's not so true when this code was designed and developed. In those days, if the internet worked, it was like a sign, of, it would cause a celebration, okay? Because there's so many different things that could go wrong, right? From the, uh, the link could go down, you know, any number of things can go wrong. And so we do a lot of error processing, okay? So that's the error code. So we go into the main. So the main is, uh, well, you know what the main is. It's where we enter into the program itself. And what we have over here is the SOC FD. That's the socket FD over here. That's this integer which points into the socket table. We have this thing called new SOC FD. And I'll explain that in a moment when we come to it. So just, it's, so we have actually got two socket FTs. We got one over here, the, the, what's called SOC, and the other one is the new socket. And then here's this port number, which is what we're going to use to say, okay, I'm establishing a storefront. I'm going to be listening on port number 80, for example. So that's going to be port, port number over here. That's a port number over here. We have this thing called Klylen, SOCLEN, T Klylen. Klylen is, it's kind of an archaic thing. It just we need to kind of have the you know, sort of the length of the client that you're going to is going to connect to us. And for now, you can ignore that. That's not very important. The next one is the buffer, and that's critical. The buffer is what you're reading and writing to. So when you want to read from the socket on the server side, which is over here, you're going to have to read from the socket and put it somewhere. And that somewhere is buffer, and for that we've chosen an array of size 256 because we're not expecting anything. We're going to expecting we're expecting only 256 bytes to come in over here, okay? And that's the uh, buffer over here, okay? Now, uh, some of you may have heard of these things called buffer overrun as a way of doing uh, of breaking into servers, right? How many of you have heard of a buffer overrun errors? Right, so uh, this is exactly how you do buffer overrun errors. So here, the buffer is of size 256, okay? So if, if you give somebody a very large buffer, much larger buffer, right? What would happen is that it would overrun the buffer and then bad things will happen to the server if you don't write it properly. And unfortunately, the uh, early days when people wrote network code, they didn't write it properly. And so this buffer would get overrun and that's how you would get attacks on servers, okay? So I won't go into the attacks. You can easily look it up as buffer overrun errors but this is the buffer that's causing buffer overruns. 
Then we have the SOC, uh, the, uh, we have two addresses over here, the SOC adder ion, server adder and client adder. So it's the server address and the client address and these are these data structures over here. So here we're going to describe the server address and the client address actually is what is, we're going to get who connected to us, right? We need to know who connected to us. That's the client address and this is the server address. So that's the, the two SOC adder ions, uh, the server address and the client address. And then here this int n, this n is just basically for us to make sure we aren't going to get buffer over on errors, okay? And, we, we, and I'll tell you in a minute how we do that with n over here. So those are the uh, 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 variables in this program. What does the structure mean? It's a variable. It's oh, struct, a struct is like an object. Oh. A struct is like an object. So basically a struct, okay, uh, struct has a name and then it has field one, okay, like int field one, you know, car, whatever, field two, <coughs> etc. And so then that's a structure, it's an object. Right, so it has some elements in it like an object does. So objects in Java came from structures in C. Okay, and so we have these three fields in that structure, address family, IP address, and port number. Okay, so moving along, we have the first thing is make sure you have enough Argument. So in C, by convention, uh, the argument count tells you the first argument is uh, given to the program is the name of the program itself. So if you, if you call this program server, if it says server, you know, 24, then server is argument 1, 24 is argument 2, and if you have less than two arguments, then you don't have a port number because you can invoke this as server port number, right? That's the name you're going to, that's how you're going to invoke it. So you say, hey, I don't need, I don't have a port, I'm out of luck. So you get out of here. That's that. Then the next part is where we get the first real call, which is SOC FD. So we get the socket FD and we call using the call called socket, okay, which in the socket is basically returning an endpoint to us. Nothing has actually happened. We're establishing the storefront still. So we're calling socket, we're saying, I want an internet socket. I want address family INET and I want it to be stream. Stream means I want communication to be reliable, so it means I want TCP, okay, and we haven't really talked about stream and datagram very much, but if you remember I said uh, in the first or second lecture that we have two kinds of APIs over here, one in which we kind of have a circuit, we have a connection end-to-end, -end, and that's called a stream connection, and so I'll probably write that on over here, so connection, uh, when you have connection oriented communication, so connection oriented is the same as in the internet, same as TCP, the same as SOC stream. And if you want datagram, which is not connection oriented, then datagram is the same as UDP and that would be SOC dgram. So what we're telling the system is give me an endpoint and this endpoint is going to be something that I want to communicate on using TCP and it's going to use internet style addresses, okay? And that's the socket call, the zero at the end, ignore that for now. Okay, so that's, so we're saying give me an endpoint. Remember it's a server, server needs an endpoint, so this is the endpoint, we got it. Okay, we haven't and you had any communication yet, we're just still kind of establishing the storefront here. And the first thing we need is get an endpoint, and we say, I need an endpoint on which I'm going to communicate using TCP. The next is error processing. If SOC FD is less than zero, for some reason, they can't give you an endpoint. Maybe too many endpoints are already in use. You say, okay, I'm out of here. I can't get out. I can't do it. So you error opening a socket. The next thing you're doing is the B0. What you're doing is we have this, if you notice we have the serve adder, which was the SOC adder ion the server adder address, we want to just be sure that it's zero, okay? Sometimes when you allocate something in the program, it may have some crud left over from the last time the memory was used, okay? It shouldn't happen, but it might, okay? Whenever you get any memory and it's important like this, it's very important to zero it out, okay? Just clean it out and that's what we're doing. So B0 is a command that says, Z, fill it with zero bytes, just clean it out, and that's B0 over here, and we're saying the size of the structure is size of server address, that's how long, how many bytes you want to fill, and the pointer is a, ampersand server address, this is the address, and then this many bytes, just wipe it out, fill it with zeros, okay? Again, just being careful, 
Okay, I'm going to go to the other place over here. So we have memory over here. This is your RAM. And somewhere in memory is this uh, serve adder. Okay, and the ampersand serve adder is a pointer to that. All right, and we're saying treat it Treat it like a character pointer, okay? Pretend as if it's a character and then go basically zero it out with B0. That's what you're saying over here, okay? Any questions? Yes? So why do we need to force it to be a character? Oh, I see. Because the thing is B0, the function called B0 takes character pointer. Oh. It's, a, it's a function, it's a byte zero. B stands for bytes. I'm going to zero at bytes. One character at a time. One byte at a time. So I need bytes. Okay. It's a, <laughs> let me put it like this, uh, it's, uh, this is how the things are done in C, okay, we, got, we want to zero out bytes, we just say we zero out bytes, we don't really care what the underlying structure is, we're going to wipe it out clean anyway, right? So that's what we're doing over here. So this length is size of, that's the size of the uh, serve adder, that's the size of that structure, is obviously size of serve adder. That, let's say size of serve adder is 20 bytes, then we'll say, okay, for, for this pointer onwards, for the next 20 bytes, put zeros in it. So we're cleaning it out. Okay, and that's how we clean stuff. Okay, and uh, I think Python doesn't do this either. I think Python, you get a clean, you, when you do something, you get a clean. Any, any, any language which has new, you know, gives you clean stuff, but C doesn't actually, it's supposed to, but not always. Okay. All right, so next we have this thing which says port no, okay, I'm going to clear this so I can, so the next one says a port number, which is the ID over here, so A to I arg B1, so let's look at this a little bit, port no equals A to I, oops, arg V. So there's a lot of stuff hidden in this little thing, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So first let's look at arg V1. So the parameters that are passed into the program are called the argument vector, okay? And the argument vector looks like this. So your argv, argv0 is the name of the program by convention. That's a string. Argument1 equals first string passed to or passed in. And then argv2 equals second string that's passed in and so on. So for example, if I invoke this as server, okay, a, b, c, then argv1 will be a, argv2 will be b, c. And they'll be the string a and the string b, c, okay? So this would be, become a, and this would be the string b, c. So automatically going to be of, stri of type string, okay? So this is a string. Okay, but remember we want a number. Okay, we want the port number, like 20 or 84 or 2000, right? So A to I is stands for ASCII to integer. And so it's taking that string, like, you know, the string, let's say, in this case, if I say server, and I give it uh, 2400, then I'm going to get this string to be the string 2400. And then this is going to be 2400. And this is going to be 2400, the integer. Because A to I converts the string into integer. Okay? And that's A to I for you. Okay, so that's why we need it. Now the argument con, by the way, is arc C. So arc C is going to be 2 over here because the first argument, second argument, if I have that, then arc C will be 3 and so on. Right? Because there are three arguments, name itself and then the first two arguments. <coughs> we are at this line that says port no equals a 2 i arg v1 and what we've done now is simply to get the port number from the argument that was passed in, let's say 2400, and that's the port number that you can listen to. So at this point I should add that in most computing systems, though not all, any port numbers below 1024 are considered to be privileged ports or special ports. So if you try to 
uh, if you try to uh, establish a storefront on a port number below 1024, you have to be a special user, privileged user. And so uh, certainly on our Unix systems that you're going to be doing your homework assignments on, we have that. So don't try to connect, uh, don't try to establish a port number on the server side below 1024. So use any number higher than that between 1024 and 2 to the power 16, 65,535. Those numbers are all okay. Anything beyond that is not good. All right, so we're now going to start filling up the SOC adder IN structure, okay? That's the next three lines. Serve adder dot assign family, address, and port. Do you see those three lines? Everybody see those three lines over here? Serve adder dot assign family, uh, adder, and port. So the details of this structure are not super critical, but I'm just going to tell you that the family is AF inet. We said that. The uh, SIN adder dot S adder, this is a sub uh, field, but it's not important that it's a sub field. It just basically says any. So the specific thing is this capitals, IN adder, any means it's a predefined type in the header file. It says I'll accept anybody. Okay, that's that's what we're doing this the next line. And the last line, server dot sign port, okay. Uh, S I N port, it's not SIN, it means S stands for socket, I N is internet. So internet socket port is this funny thing called H2NS port node. So we have H2NS port node. So I'm going to explain that in a minute. So let's look at that. H2NS port node. Do you see that? So the uh, Reason for this particular uh, construct is the following. Uh, uh, when we have a byte in memory, right, a byte is 8 bits, uh, then we can do, so that's 8 bits, that's one byte, okay, that's easy, okay, that's easy to represent, everybody represents it the same thing. This is the least significant bit and this is the most significant bit, okay. So most significant meaning the highest order bits. So this is two to the power um, uh, seven. This is two to the power zero. Okay, so that's how we do MSB and LSB. Okay, so right now if we have two bytes, then we have it's called a short. Short is two bytes. So we have one byte like this and the other byte like this. And so it turns out there are two different ways of representing this. So here we, we always have MSB and LSB over here inside each byte. But it turns out that the two ways of presenting this, and we just call them one, two, two, one. So we kind of swap them around, okay? That's the way it's done. So some computers represent it in this way, some represent it in this way, and there's some, there are very abstru uh, abstract arguments why one is better than the other, and uh, it's not even worth arguing. And these are called big endian and little, little endian approaches. But anyway, it doesn't really matter what they are. We want to make sure that when, I, when we send a shot, when we send a shot into the system, the other side is going to get the shot as well. It's not going to get uh, something that's swapped around. Right? We want to send, if I say port number uh, 2400, I don't want the network to interpret it as port number something else because the bytes got swapped around. Okay, So what we have is what's called network order. This is called the network order, network byte order. And this is called the host byte order. And what this is doing is it's converting the host byte order to network byte order for the for a shot. Okay. And so you take the port number, which is an integer, which is actually a shot, uh, which is two bytes, or what we call a shot. And you're converting a shot into from host order to network order, and that's what you're filling in into this port number over here because we don't want the network to be confused. We say the network order is this, no matter what the host is, it must give it in that format, and we give it in that format over here. Okay? And that's what the H2NS is doing. Once we do this, the next call is the, again we kind of the important call. That's the actual established storefront. So that's being done using the bind call. So we first got the socket. That gives us the endpoint. Now we do the bind, 
And the bind call, if you look at it, is basically saying, okay, I have the SOC FD, that's the in pointer over here, and I want to fill in those fields over here, and I do that using the bind call by giving it the server address, okay, which has all these fields filled in. Okay, I have all the fields filled in, I just fill them in. I'm going to now fill in these fields and stick it in, and that's done using the bind call over here. So you do socket call with a bind call. At this point, this socket on the server side is listening for any incoming IP address on the internet on the port number, and the port number came from the argument through A2I and then H2NS. Okay, those are the two steps. Okay, so remember that what we're trying to do is to establish our storefront. So first you need an endpoint. The endpoint is an entry in the socket table, right? So first we want to get uh, a, a sort of empty entry over here. We do that using the socket call. Socket call returns to us a socket FD, let's say five. So these guys are used up, I get a new one. Let's say that's what's going to return to me. Okay, that's a socket call, okay? That's a SOC FT equals socket AFI net SOC stream zero. Yeah. Okay, then after that, we are getting the, uh, we're clearing out the, the, uh, the serve adder, which is the B0, we're finding out the port number, and then we're filling in the serve adder with the, uh, with the addresses, so with, with the information. We want I, AFI net, we want I net or any, and then we want to put in the port number as being what we got from the command line argument, H2NS port no, okay? And then bind says, okay, all this information, just stick it in here. This is what the bind call does. Because these three things have got to go uh, over here. And that's binding it, it's putting it on. That's like putting up a name plate that says, this is my tattoo parlor, right? This is the, my, this is the I'm gonna accept anybody, uh, any uh, who's coming on the internet, and who's on the sport. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm saying over here. Okay, so the bind sets it up, and then at this point, we're going to go and listen. Okay, that's what we're doing with the listen call. It says, okay, I have this set up. I want to go listen to socket ID 4, right? That's what we're going to do. And the, uh, the 5 is just ignore that for now. That's sort of, uh, it's not important right now. That has to do with a very large server, and many things are coming in. But for now, just ignore the 5, and uh, we're listening on this 4 over, over here. And uh, now what's happening is that we're going to be blocked on the listen. We're going to sit here and listen and listen and listen. And now when you go to the client side, you'll find they're going to do a connect. And that's when we're going to come out of the listen. So listen is a blocking call. We're just kind of waiting. And then the next one, the client, remember the client is this archaic thing. We don't really need it. So ignore that. What happens next is the interesting part where we say new SOC FD equals accept SOC FD, CLI adder, CLI LEN. What we're doing over here is that when we accept, we get a new socket address. We get a new entry over here, like file, okay? This is the socket that we are listening on. And every time we accept, we get something new over here, okay? And the reason is like this. I have a customer coming to my tattoo parlor. I, I'm, 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 you know, while I'm, uh, Tattooing them, somebody else may show up, right? What do they do? Well, they're going to sit there, basically, waiting at the door until I accept them, right? But what I'd like to have is something like a waiting room, right? I want to have somebody come in, and while I'm doing the work, this is sitting there, and then I can keep accepting people, okay? So I want to sort of be able to uh, listen always on the port number, which is a well-known port number, but as each customer comes in, I'm going to assign them a different port number, and a different socket information over here. And so each customer would have its own separate socket thing. So I want to kind of hand off and create new temporary sockets, if you will. New temporary entries in the socket table corresponding to each connection. So I'm always listening on port 80, but as people get accepted, they're going to be handed off to port, let's say 32,000 or port 74,000, uh, sorry, port seven, uh, 64,000, whatever. Right. So people, it's like, I, I have tattoo part of multiple sort of tattooing, I have people working for me, so I'm always listening, but they say, okay, go to room one, you go to room two, you go to room three. I'm always listening on the front door. That's my listening. And then each connection I accept results in a new connection in the table over here. Okay, and that's what's going on over here. So if you look, you see carefully, I get this thing called new SOC FD, it's a new socket, and I'm accepting on the SOC FD, on this one over here, 
and then the next two are basically saying, tell me who connected, the client adder, client adder is the client address which looks just like the server address, so it will tell you what address, which IP it came from and which port number it connected to, okay, but we don't really care. In this particular example, we don't really care, but you can care. That's how Apache knows where you're connected from. So just a moment, come to you. Uh, if you remember the homework assignment, if you see the homework assignment, where this thing it says, you are coming from so-and-so IP address, right? You are coming from Kitchener. You are coming from this browser. How does it know where you came from? It came from the Cliadder parameter over here. Okay, so at this point, we're pretty much done because we got the new SOC FD. Now what we're going to do in the next line, B0, is we're going to empty out the, clear out the buffer. Okay, the buffer is already character, so I don't need to cast it. I just say a B0 buffer is 256 bytes, just zap it. And then we just read on the new SOC FD. So this new SOC FD we got over here is the one that we're going to read and write on from the server side. Okay, so we just say read. So whatever was sent by the client is going to be read over here. Okay, and now there's a gotcha over here. And the gotcha is that if the client writes, let's say 20 bytes, the server when it does a read may not get 20 bytes. It may get five, it may get 10, it may get up to 20 bytes, but we don't know how many bytes. Okay, and the reason is because it may be necessary for the client side, if it's a very slow connection or if there's a lot of what's called network congestion, to send fewer bytes than what it wanted. So, you may say send 20,000 bytes, but you may not be able to send 20,000 bytes, you may only send 200 bytes or 400 bytes. So, when you do this read over here, n equals read, that n tells you how many bytes you actually got. Okay, it's how many bytes you actually got, and the 255 at the end. That one says read up to 255 bytes. In the bad buggy code, what happened was that people didn't put the value of 255, they put a value of zero. That means read whatever is there. Okay, and that was, that's what caused buff, uh, buffer overrun because somebody sent more than 255, that would cause this read system call to happily overwrite the, the buffers. Okay, by limiting the 255 over here, putting the 255, we make sure we don't get buffer overrun errors and that N tells us how many bytes we actually got. Okay, now that we read it, we've now got, we got the bytes, we actually had network communication happen. The client sent some bytes and the host received, other side got it. We managed to achieve network communication from anywhere to anywhere on the internet. You could be sitting in Antarctica or on Mars, once you get the read, you got the bytes from Mars, which is fantastic. Okay, the feeling you have when you write this code and run it is quite awesome. The client side, uh, I'll go through it pretty fast because actually it's pretty straightforward. If you start at the top, you have the same includes. The structures that you have over here are almost all the same, except we have this new structure, this host end structure. Okay, and I'll come to that in a minute. Everything else is the same. Okay. So if you go down, uh, the port number equals A2I argv2. Here we're saying that we're going to have the arguments as client the name of the server and the server port number. So you say client, you know, linux.student.cs.uwatulu.ca, port number 34000. That port number is the third argument, so it's argv2. And then what we're doing is we're establishing the client side in the socket. So we do the socket, same thing, we got the socket endpoint, and we're calling that soc fd. Remember, this client side, we have a socket table as well, we have a socket descriptor. This gives us a small integer, like three or five or seven, which is the socket fd. Okay, then after that, the only difference between client and server really, the main difference is over here we see server equals get host by name argv1. Has everybody see that? This is how we get into DNS. So we're getting into DNS and we're saying, hey DNS, I'm giving you this name, uh, cs.uwatulu.ca, tell me the server's IP address. And so we say get host by name. So give me the host's IP address, that's a getting the host by name and giving it the name. Okay, and that returns to you the server, which is a host end, right? The host end, which is what is returned by DNS, as I said earlier. Okay, and then what we do at this point is we zero out the server address, we set the server address to be uh, inet, the address family to be inet, and this B copy over here, where you're copying from the server pointer h adder to sinadder.s adder, 
this copy is essentially copying the IP address into the socket. Okay, so this it, it's a, and the, that piece of code over there uh, is not very nice. But what it's really doing is it's copying the, what was returned by DNS, the host end field, into the uh, serve adder field, and and then the port is being set again. H two NS is being done. The next line serve adder sign port is H two NS port number. It's setting the port number using H two NS as before, and then finally we're doing the connect. What we're saying on connect is connect on this socket that I got using the server whose address family and IP address and port number I just set up okay and uh, that's it connect so at this point the connection is established from here to here once you do that that sock FD can be used for reading and writing and so we see over here we, you know zeroing out the buffer the F get S from STDN means read from screen Read, read from keyboard, I'm sorry, standard in is keyboard, read from keyboard, and then write to the socket, and we're basically done. Okay, so the last few bits are pretty straightforward. So on the client side, what we're really doing is we are uh, setting up the, uh, we're figuring out the IP address in the host 10 data structure, and then we are setting up the, the entry, but we're not using bind for it. We're just using connect, and connect takes the entry over here, puts it in the table for you. It's part of the connect. And at this point, you have a SOC FD that you can read and write on, and you'll see what's happening. I would encourage you to uh, log in to your Linux account and run the client and server side, <coughs> run them both, connect to them, see what happens, modify the code. It will be really instructive. So this is all I'm going to talk about for the socket programming and on next two weeks Andy will be talking about TCP, so he's got, sorry, transport layer, I'm going to go straight into transport layer from now on.